Hey guys, welcome and thanks so much for tuning in to this edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. And I'm so excited to talk to the guest that I have today because my guest today has a family legacy of cannabis activism. She has a background in engineering and in public education and has now turned her focus full-time to cannabis activism. A true renaissance woman, she serves many roles, including the head of the Peter Tosh Legacy and Brand Managing, uh, Managing Member of the Tosh Holdings LLC, board chairperson for the Peter Tosh Foundation, and president for the Peter Tosh Capital LLC. Nayambe McIntosh, thank you so much for welcome to be a part of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Hi, Montel. Uh, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Please, thank you so much for being a part of the show today. You know, um, I, I think what I'd love to do is let's, let's just go back on a little journey in, down memory lane. I mean, you were, your background is very interesting. You were born in Jamaica and you grew up in Boston. Is that correct? That is correct. My mom is from Boston, so she met my dad, fell in love, and then moved to Jamaica, where she had uh, my brother Jawara and I. And um, that had to have been uh, that, that had to be an, a, just an incredible experience growing up with one of the, you know, most vocal and and most powerful voices of the Rastafarian and and Jamaican music scene, right? Uh, the irony is that my father passed, you know, when I was really young. And so I really grew up with, you know, his stories and his music and his message, but um, unfortunately not his, his, you know, physical self. But um, yes, yeah, definitely been been a journey. To say the and what, is, what are some of your early memories? I'm sorry, you passed when you were very young, but I'm, I'm sure that and I said it this way, that after his passing, I mean, his legacy is so strong. What was that like for you? Uh, you know, it wasn't until I turned around um, 17 where I became a DJ and um, really started immersing myself in, in the music. And uh, Equal Rights and Justice is really the song that kind of hit my spirit in a way that move me, you know, and, and um, I think that when you're, when you're in it as a child, you don't necessarily realize it until you get older about, you know, what, how powerful and the legacy really is. And it's not until like, you know, now that I'm 40, you know, throughout my thirties where I've definitely had a deep dive and immersed myself into just the history. Gotcha. I mean, uh, but, but be before that you, you were a DJ at age 17, but then you decided to take the path of education. Let's talk a little bit about your career path. I mean, you've got a very, very interesting one. You got a degree in engineering? Yes, I went to school um, in Boston at Wentworth Institute of Technology. Um, I was just uh, tech savvy as a child and um, thought that's what I wanted to do. I was like, okay, if you you know like taking things apart, I, I think you're supposed to be an engineer. Um, and so I, that was, that was, we, we share that I'm gonna have a degree right. in engineering. <laughs> so went into engineering and, and did that for some time, but I've always had a, a love and appreciation for, for young people and children. And so, um, I decided to do a career change and, um, did an accelerated teaching program to get my master's in education. And then went back to teaching high school, grade school. What, what, did, what did you say? Yeah, I taught. Um, I taught high school special ed in math. Um, I wanted to teach really little, uh, little young children, but um, the demand was in high school. Had the highest turnover rates, and um, I wanted to go where the need was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I kind of remember myself also that my, I thought the same thing as a child. I used to take everything apart. You, yep. you put it in front of me, I took it apart and put it back together and try to figure out why did I have this piece left over? Let me do right. it again. <laughs> again. Then, then you wouldn't have any pieces left over and you couldn't figure out where the last screw was that you didn't find out how it was before. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. So you now, uh, growing up though, this is a family that, you know, with a, with the legacy of a father who, was an advocate and, you know, a staunch supporter of Rastafarian life and cannabis. Were you a cannabis enthusiast? Were you educated in cannabis in those years when you were younger? 
honestly, my dad was the the only education I I had from listening to songs like Legalize It, where he goes through, you know, um, some of the medicinal benefits of being good for asthma. And, and then in the song Bush Doctor, he's talking about it being good for glaucoma. Um, and that was really the only education I had growing up. Um, and then when I started to see cannabis legalized, um, you know, that's when I realized that he was spot on. He was well educated, but um, you know, as way a, ahead of his time. Yes, definitely, definitely. As an educator, it was something that I I, I hid. I wasn't really um, outward an outward you know consumer of cannabis. I I didn't want to be have any influence on young people in that particular way, and so I, I did hide that until I switched careers. And and it was it you know may, and a lot of people may not be familiar with you know the story of your brother and and what happened but was that the impetus for you changing over and saying we've got to do something about this? It was. Um, I, I I actually um, it was uh, 2013 when uh, Jawara um, Peter's youngest son was arrested for cannabis possession in New Jersey. It was actually Father's Day weekend. And um, New Jersey is this kind of uh, strange prison economy where, um, you know, they're, they, he, my brother didn't even have a hearing until like three months later. You know, I'm, I'm from Massachusetts and where, where, you know, you get arrested, you have your hearing the next business day. Um, but we didn't really know what was going on for my brother's case for, for three months. And so, it wasn't until his hearing um, that we realized how serious the case was, and the prosecution had uh, offered a 20-year plea plea deal. And my brother, being a father of four, a follower of Rastafari, um, a musician, and an activist, um, that and had never had any you know encounter with the police at all. That definitely um, just blew you know our world. And so he was able to make bail um, by the end of 2013 and had gone back and forth for pretrial motions for several years, being told that, you know, he needs to take the plea deal. It's it's the best offer that they're gonna that you're gonna get. And they'll keep lowering it by a few years, you know, down to 15 years and then down to 10. And eventually, uh, when it got down to five years. He was told that, you know, maybe you'll probably just do time served. You know, you'll probably end up in there for maybe six months tops. And, you know, you probably should take the plea. And we were torn between, you know, standing up for what we believe in. We recognize the plant as a sacrament. It's very much just a part of our lives. And um, but even back then, at that time around the country, we already saw cannabis laws were starting to change. Exactly. Exactly. But on the other hand, uh, New Jersey definitely had some of the highest mass incarceration rates in the country. And uh, we were afraid that my brother would be made an example of if we went to trial. And so um, he decided to take the plea in 2016. And in 2017... Um, that's, wait, heard- that's, really, that's really insane because I literally helped Governor... Corzai, I testified before the New Jersey legislation back, I think it was 20, 20, 2003, 2003, 2004. I testified before the New Jersey legislation and did that. They had already passed a cannabis law in the state of New Jersey that then Governor Christie did not put in place. So this was like, you know, what, 16 or 13 years later. Your brother's arrested. I, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm so shocked that I didn't know anything about that at the time. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's okay. I think that the context is, is definitely important, you know. And so in 2017, he, he turned himself in, um, and we all thought that this would be something that, okay, you'll go in there, you know, we'll, we'll tough it out, and but it'll be something you put behind you. Um, a month later, uh, I get a frantic call from my mom and she's crying. She's saying, um, Niambi, there's a there's a surgeon on the phone. There's something about uh, Gamel, that's his middle name. That's what we called him. And um, the surgeon says, uh, you know, I, I need to get um, authorization to perform a life-saving medical procedure on your brother, your son. 
he's been attacked by an inmate. Um, he suffered a traumatic brain injury. And so um, we immediately authorized the, the procedure and flew to um, Hackensack Medical Center, where um, initially when we got there, we were told that we couldn't even visit him. They said that he's a ward of the state. You need to call the, the prison. You need to call the jail, Bergen County Jail. And so, um, you know, we call the jail and they're like, well, normally we don't allow visitation, you know. And so this would this is a we'll, we'll make an exception, though. And honestly, I, I, I know that it's because of my father's name why that exception was made. Um, and so we got into the surgical ICU where he was. Um, he had a neck brace on. He had tubes down his throat, half of his locks. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Half of his locks were shaved off of his head and um, he had a handcuff on his ankles and he was surrounded by correctional officers while he was fighting for his life. He was completely um, incapacitated, um, unable to talk, um, do anything for himself. Um, and that is actually the day that I quit teaching. Um, I knew that I had a bigger cause, a bigger mission. Um, all over, you know, a plant is just unacceptable. And so um, we actually uh, ended up being able to take him home months later. But unfortunately, after a year, um, in 2020, actually, is when he passed away and succumbed to his injuries. And so, you know, people did he ever did he ever recover enough to be lucid or no? He. You know, the journey, I, I'm really grateful for having um, my mom and I actually took him home. And so it was 24 hour care. And he uh, the irony is that with cannabis medicine, he was able to um, he got to the point where I, I was able to walk up to him and say, can you what's my name? And he like it was hard for him, but he was like me, um, B. And, um, you know, he was a, he had muscle memory. So I put a vape pen or a spliff to his mouth. And so he wasn't able to do a lot. But the one thing he did not forget was how to, you know, inhale, hold it in and then blow it out his nose. And um, so he did uh, make progress and he was making slow progress. Um, but it was definitely a, a fight for him to just regain some of the simplest skills, you know. Um, and whatever happened to the inmate that did this to him? Uh, he was charged and um, in that, 20 But I had it turned into a murder charge, right? Because he actually he did get upgraded to, uh, to, to I want to say, murder. I forget which degree of murder, right. but... Um, I make a point not to to follow something that I can't control. My energy right. was really on just being there for my brother and um, and sharing his story. You know, I think that legalization is extremely eminent. You know, prison is no place for for anyone. Like, and my brother was had this the larger you know this larger big personality, larger than life spirit that. Um, didn't belong. It didn't belong in our, in our, you know, criminal justice, in our failed prisons. It's, well, and especially because I think when, when we, when we really stop and, and listen to and think about your brother's story, and maybe you ought to explain it to people who don't understand, your brother was a Rastafarian. And as a Rastafarian, cannabis is part of a sacrament. It's part of a religious um, um, entitlement in a way. And you know, I think around the country, even when he was arrested, there have been exceptions made for cannabis as a religious sacrament. Um, explain a little bit of that to people so they understand what that means. Definitely. Um, and so the um, lifestyle of Rastafari, we don't like to necessarily call it a religion, but um, recognizes the plant as a sacrament. And there are um, verses within the Bible that talk about the holy herb. Um, and man, you know, and early are being for, for man. Um, and so we, we recognize it to be a plant that 
allows us to connect with a higher power spiritually. And it's really a, a divine experience that when we consume, it's, and, and honestly, I feel like it's a universal experience. It's not just, you know, um, followers, people that recognize or, or follow Rastafari, uh, consuming and having a spiritual experience where you're feeling good about yourself, you're reasoning to, to with others to, to elevate your mind, your body, your spirit is the way that we engage with the plan and it's, and it's respected in that way. And so um, this is really very much a part of part of our lives. And it and it took the experience with my brother, especially being raised in the United States to to own that as fully, because there was a part of me that was upset with him for, you know, at first you're like, damn, why'd you get in trouble? And then, you know, it's almost like you know, being thrown back in time where riding on the, you know, in the, in the front of the bus was wrong. You know, it, it's, that's not okay. You know, it's not okay for a system to target particularly people that look like me and you and um, send us to jail over a plant. And so, and then that's anybody that it's a plant that has only helped people, you know, you have your testimony and I definitely have, uh, it's helped me through just dealing with the trauma from my, from my brother's experience. And, and in so many ways, you know, from inspiration to creativity, um, to ultimate healing, you know, mind, body, and spirit. Absolutely. Well, now, you know, and you, you, you transitioned over because of this event and started working for criminal justice and for justice reform and for advocating, you know, broader acceptance of cannabis and also ensuring that people who want to use it have, you know, efficacious access. Are you doing that specifically in New Jersey or are you doing that nationwide? Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, in 2015, we started the Peter Tosh foundation and, um, I knew that in you know carrying on my father's legacy, we we I wanted to have a strong foundation, literally and figurative, figuratively. But um, you know, once my brother um, was attacked, uh, we launched Justice for Jawara, where we are geared at just bringing awareness to his story, um, to make sure that you know legal to, to have people understand you know that it's it's not just war on drugs it's a war on families it's a war on communities and on people and it's eminent that the plant um is fully legalized uh, no one should be incarcerated and so through that initiative we've partnered with um last prisoner project we've also done some partnerships with minorities for medical marijuana as well and uh the hopes to just bring awareness to, um, you know, the situation and the need for legalization. But then you've said it twice, you know, you think that it's eminent, but do you really feel that it's eminent? Because I think that as many steps as we've taken forward, it seems to be that we're taking several steps back. Um, when you look around the country at some of the attitudes about cannabis and the fact that we're, st we're still living in a time where we have a nation where we have, what, 40 or no, sorry, it's 37 states in the District of Columbia and all 37 of them do it differently. And we still have no ability to, to uh, take products across state lines. I mean, I just recently launched, um, I'm in the process of relaunching my branded products uh, nationally. I have a CBD line that hopefully as soon as we finish some of our technical, um, we, we cross some of our technical hurdles, We'll be back in the marketplace because I tell you again, states have made this such a daunting process, even when it comes to just selling CBD, even though we have the, the farm bill that allowed CBD to be sold, CBD is having such strange restrictions around the country just from a labeling standpoint. So, you know, you end up selling a product that has to make sure that it adheres to the lab the stringent labor and labeling laws of every single state. Yep. And then, you know, you have THC products that can't cross straight state lines. So now I've just relaunched the brand new THC line in the state of Massachusetts, which is doing extremely well. But I couldn't sell that in New Jersey or sell that in Florida where I live because I have to find a new manufacturer in each individual state to make that product available to, to patients and consumers and people who are just trying to deal with life. So, I mean, um, you say, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm not saying this in a you know, challenging way, but you say that 
you think that it's eminent, I'm going to ask you, what does eminent mean? Do you think in the next five to 10 years? I'm saying the need, the need is eminent. Oh, the the need is immediate. I got you. Yes, the need is eminent. It's time to legalize it right away. And and the hurdles that you speak of is is only hurting uh, people that that need the plant. You know, it's hurting families. It's it's continuing to to have people incarcerated. People don't have access to medicine. The the complications of of the legal in of the legal industry with you know labeling. I've I've definitely dealt with some of those myself as we um, continue to work on um, establishing our brand. Uh, but it's it's you know I. It's it's now is the time, you know. Um, yeah, I, I I understand what you mean now. You're absolutely right. I believe I, I agree with you 100. percent Now is the time. But do you are you are you? I'm I'm not a pessimist, and I will tell right. you that I yeah. am not a pessimist. But I truly believe that, you know, for several reasons. A couple of them is this industry itself. You know, the industry is can be its worst nightmare. We can be our our worst enemy. You know, where we have. You know, people around the country trying to sell THC-8 and THCO and all these derivatives that are just being created for no other reason than to be able to bring the DEA down on our head. And, um, you know, uh, I, I believe in the whole plant and I believe in what nature made, not what man wants to process it into, except for when we're just doing basic extractions to be able to take the oil out. I agree with that 100%. But it just seems... Like, you know, as we get, like I said, we take a couple steps forward and then we take huge steps back. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, one of the problems is just the ignorance, you know, and that's why education is extremely important because the people that are here making the decisions around the regulations and around um, some of the rules, it's it's people that don't understand um, the plant and holistically. And so you have certain places where they were trying to put, you know, THC caps. And, you know, I'll, I've actually listened to an interview with you, um, particularly where you mentioned that how, you know, the, the dosage that you need, you know, to be at balance. And I'm thinking, you know, there are so many people that are like you that, that need high doses of THC. So we're in this place where on one hand, we I, I, I want to, to be optimistic and recognize the steps that we continue to make, you know, where we see medicinal um, um, cannabis legalized and, and the slow progress of things. And then on the other hand, um, we have a long way to go. You're absolutely right. There's so much that needs to be done to, to, to make sure that this is accessible. The, the small technicalities about labeling and this label needs to be here. I, I, I am continuing to just fight for the day where, you know, as a nation, we recognize that this plant needs to, you know, be reclassified, descheduled and, um, and made. And we're, seeing, we're starting to see it all over the world. I mean, you say there's this nation, I mean, the, the world, I, I think there's well over 40 countries in the world now that have legalized some form of cannabis use because, you know, the United States fought diligently to ban hemp and hemp, you know, import, export all over the world. But now the world is starting to say, wait a second, why the devil should we listen to you? Exactly. And I, I'm so happy that the world is starting to say that because, you know, uh, we we don't have all the answers in any way, shape or form. And, you know, I'm starting to look around the world and see that in places like Colombia, Argentina, Spain, mm-hmm. Dollar Man, Africa, you know, India, you know, China, there are places around the world that are starting to recognize that we let the United States destroy a resource for the planet. Yep. Especially when, you know, it can do so much good for the planet, not just in the human consumable side, but in the, the you know, there's there's probably 2,500 different uses of cannabis and, and the biomass that can be used for everything from bricks to batteries to clothing to textiles to you name it to plastic and you know it just seems like we are i I just don't understand and maybe you can help me figure it out i know that some of it's ignorance you nailed it but i I just don't understand why we can be so vehemently adamant against something that does so much good i mean it it started with the the propaganda from the beginning and so I, i i do see that most people are starting to to recognize 
the benefits of the plant. But at this point, it's it's all political, you know, and, and now we end up playing a political game with people's lives. Um, most of America wants some form of legalized cannabis in, in their state. I and think most recently, most recently, the numbers are as high as about 92 percent of people agree with medical cannabis as being a viable option for people. And I think the told the, the numbers are in the high 60s now, maybe low 70 yeah. percent of the nation just agrees that we should just may may as well not decriminalize, but go ahead and legalize because, you know, we know for a fact in the history of mankind, there's not been one death from cannabis. Exactly. Not one. Not, not one. Yet we have pharmaceutical companies that are able to, to kill people on a daily basis through overdose and um, all types of, of... And do so and get away with it. That's the part about that just throw, blows my mind. I mean, yeah. you still look at the, you know, at, at the opioid addiction uh, crisis in the world perpetrated by, you know, one family. Mm -hmm. And... You know, even recently that they've changed the laws a little bit to allow the family to be sued. Uh, they can't be sued, I think, individually. The corporation can be sued, but they can't be sued right. individually. And they're the ones who made the decision. Yep. 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 It's definitely, I mean, I I, I, I recognize all the hurdles. And um, when you're in it, there's you have to literally live in a dichotomy. You have to see all the BS, you know, and right. acknowledge it. And then on the other hand, you you have to, you know, celebrate the baby steps because otherwise you'll be you'll be living depressed, you know what yeah, I mean? Well, well, yeah, especially especially <laughs> yeah. in this world right now, right? Exactly. There's so much, you know, um that that is going on. And it's just even outside of just cannabis that the, you know, there's there's this way way too much just um that weighs on us as a society. And so um you know, I, I, I'm glad that New Jersey finally legalized, you know, after my brother's situation, uh, there's going to be, you know, no family will have to go through what my family has gone through. Um, but it still does. It's bittersweet. It still does hurt that my brother isn't here, you know? And yeah, so, and, you know, I mean, are they not still arresting people in New Jersey for my, my cannabis violations? The numbers always continue to, to drop, but, um, Unfortunately, the regulations often have these fine lines that still allow, you know, police officers to to target people. And so, um, I don't think until it's fully legal and descheduled, and and you know, that's when we can at least have viable banking options. We can have a, a more open market so that people can get loans and black and brown folks can can enter in, in, in a way that is, you know, more sustainable, being able so we to can participate. Yeah, yeah, right. Intern, yeah, just a week. <laughs> I mean, so, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy out there that, uh, you know, there's so many minefields. I mean, the minefield is so huge and the walls have been put up to stop our participation, even though it's been our participation that's actually made this possible for others. Which yes. is really so ridiculous. Yeah, I speak you know, about you, the, the, the legacy. You know, the legacy uh, growers and farmers that, that are that should have the right to participate. Um, you know, without it being you know a million hurdles and a million dollars. You know, for you to to enter into the market, I would love to see an open market where mm -hmm. we as consumers have the right to choose who we want to buy from. We can we can buy from a microbrewery. We can buy from a family-owned farm. Why can't we buy cannabis from a family-owned, you know, growing business? And I, you know, I've spoken in Jamaica several times, and even in Jamaica, um, there was an issue of you know uh, allowing the legacy growers to participate yeah. in this business. That you know, all these companies outside of Jamaica bounced on the ground, put a lot of money in there, and said, no, 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 we want to take this over from Canada to Germany and other places, yeah. and. You know, the legacy grower in Jamaica doesn't even have a chance to participate. Exactly. Exactly. The 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 hurdles are are monumental. And so, you know, I I um I see a lot of people act, you know, advocating to to make it more accessible. And and I and I know that um, you know, organizations like Minorities for Medical Marijuana, Last Prisoner Project are on the front lines, you know, lobbying to to make sure that certain language is is in certain laws as certain states transition, but it's it's definitely a, a lot of work. And it's an uphill um, battle. You're absolutely right. 
you, know, and, you, you had know. started talking about, you started saying something about, you know, the Peter Tosh Foundation, but I, I kind of cut you off and I'm sorry I did so because I want to just go back and let's talk a little bit more about the foundation and what's what its main objectives are. What are you working on through the foundation? Tell me a little bit about that. Definitely. Um, so Justice for Jawara was, was one of our initiatives that we launched, but we also have um, the Peter Tosh Museum that we've opened uh, around 2015 as well to make sure that the world has a place in Kingston, Jamaica to learn about his legacy and contributions to music and culture. We have um, the Equal Rights Initiative where we partner with different organizations to just do community building and um, within different uh, countries. We have Legalize It initiative, of course, and uh, that's our partnership with Minorities for Medical Marijuana, where we are really making sure that black and brown faces have the opportunity to participate by uh, having, um, you know, expungement clinics that we that we host. We're also doing boot camps around the country to get people um have teach people how to secure cannabis licenses. Uh, and then we have Can't Blame the Youth. I, I've always had a passion for young people. And so that initiative really allows um, young people to, to learn about the message and the music of my dad and, um, you know, and, and, and um, be enlightened, you know, hoping to create the next revolutionary thinkers of tomorrow. And so it's, um, expansive, but we continue to, um, you know, do what, uh, ultimately, my father would would want to be done with with his music and his message. And you're also you mentioned them also. You mentioned the, the last prison project. You're working with them. Tell me a little bit about your foundation's work in the other last prison project. Yes, last prisoner project has been a um, a huge support for justice for Jawar and and allowing us to kind of use their platform. Um, to share his story, and um, I'm actually on the advisory board for them, and so we we are continuing to expand and 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 just use social media as a way to bring awareness to the the current need. There are still people that are incarcerated that need to be released. Thousands of people who are incarcerated that need to be released. Mm -hmm. you know, people, I don't think people understand how how broad the numbers are that uh, for people who have absolutely nonviolent, yep. small cannabis violations or spending 10, 15, 20 years in prison. But I've often said people don't recognize the fact that why is that happening? Well, because it's, you know, go back to 1937. These laws were created just so that we could have a new enslavement tool. You know, yep. the criminal justice system became the new plantations. And we wanted to make sure that we can put people in chains and people who are color in chains. So we came up with a law that we recognize that was easy to be able to do that. Yep. And, and then, so it continued on through just, you know, mass incarceration and lots of um, private corporations are using the, the part practically free labor of, of prisons to, to make money. And that's a whole nother, another angle, but um, it, it definitely stems from a continuation of slavery. And so, you know, it's definitely time that we recognize that these laws need to change. If people wanted to get involved and help you, uh, where would they go? Uh, PeterTosh.com, PeterToshFoundation.org. Um, and then we are on every social media platform at PeterTosh. And uh, what's coming up next? Is there anything coming up next? You, you were talking about you you are trying to work on a brand like we are, but you know, mm -hmm. we're on a brand also. But, but what's going on with your brand and where is it at so far? Definitely. Um, so we got two things coming up. Uh, one is is the brand. And so we've been um, just doing some designing work, making sure that the brand not only um, serves to kind of get my father's you know message out there, legalize it and I'll advertise it. Um, but seen by Peter Tosh uh, was really a vision of his of what he you know envisioned legalization should look like. And so making sure that um, the benefits and the proceeds of, of the brand are able to, a portion of the benefits are able to go to, um, you know, the Peter Tosh Foundation so that we can continue on with uh, the work that he believed in and many of us believe in. And so um, the other thing that we have coming up is International Peter Tosh Day, which we uh, designated for 420. And so that is where we uh, just celebrate the uh, my father's activism and, and contribution to cannabis um, legalization and culture, and so that's super super exciting. 
that um, we'll actually be celebrating in person in Miami this year for 420. In Miami this year? Yes. Well, this year. I'm in Miami also. Where are you going to do it? Are you? Uh, the Anderson. Where? It's going to be held at the Anderson, uh, which is a, a venue right in Miami. Okay. All right. Well, you've got to send me an invitation. I'll I definitely will. I'll 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 there. <laughs> mm -hmm. That'd be great. Right. Yeah, no, for sure. Well, I can't say thank you enough, uh, Naime, for being a part of today's show. Um, it, if ever you want to chop it up a little bit more, you can always come back. We'd love to have you back. Um, and, you know, uh, this, uh, this could be a good place for you to get your messages out whenever you want to. Okay. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. You, you stay safe, stay well. And and again, and bless you for, for sharing that story about your brother. Thank you. Appreciate yes, it. Thanks for joining me on Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear your feedback also, so please send us your comments.